Hi everyone, my name is Emily Nastas. I am an assistant science communicator with the Integration and Application Network, and today we're going to talk about data visualizations. So last week you were working on conceptual diagrams, and this week we're going to take it one step further and talk about other types of data visualizations and how you can make them. So to start, what is a data visualization? A data visualization is some kind of graphic that's going to be used to communicate information clearly and efficiently. So this graphic can be a plot, a chart, a table, a graph, maybe a map, um, but the point here is that it's going to be representative of your data. A good visualization is one that's going to help you uncover trends, realize insights, maybe tell stories about your data, it's going to make your data more accessible and understandable to your audience. So this example here is from the 2016 Chesapeake Bay Report Card. This blue line across the center is the Combined Fisheries Index. So this is the trend of these three different indicators across the last 12 years or so. Why do we make data visualizations? For a lot of different reasons. So for starters, we could use data visualizations to either represent or synthesize our data. This example here on the left is what we call the beer coaster. Um, but basically, with each ring moving towards the center, we have averaged our data again until we come up with one overall score for the system. We can use data visualizations to represent things that people couldn't see otherwise. Conceptual diagrams are a really good example of that, which you were learning about last week. And then, of course, we can use data visualizations to present context for our situations, and maps are really effective at doing that. It's definitely a good idea to include maps when and if possible. Um, maps are a really good visual way to represent your data, and people can relate to maps pretty well, especially if they're from the region in question. This one here is an example from the Tennessee River Basin report card. Um, with this example, we ended up not presenting an overall pie score um, because the data was so clear. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of yellow on this map. We can tell that the average score is going to be a C overall. So in this lecture, I also just want to give a quick shout out to a couple of data visualization pioneers that are out there. Edward Tufte being one of them. His work is really incredible. He's got a handful of books that are definitely worth leafing through if you've got the chance. These are his top, uh, his top tips for making data graphics. I just wanted to highlight a few of them. For example, your data graphics need to be content driven. I know that sounds pretty self-explanatory, but your data graphics should be representative of the data. He also suggests that you use small multiples and he means that you want to maximize your content variation and minimize your style variation. Um, the point here being that your data should be the element that changes, not your fonts or your color or your graphical elements. And then of course, know your content and know your audience. You can't expect your audience to understand the data if you can't understand the data. And your data visualizations are ultimately going to take the form that's going to best serve the presentation for your intended audience. So definitely keep those in mind when you're designing your data visualizations. Another shout out is to David McCandless. He is a British statistician, um, but he makes information graphics for a living now. And his stuff is pretty incredible. It's definitely a little more art artistically inclined, but it's definitely interesting. And these are his top 10 tips for creating data visualizations, but again I just wanted to highlight these three. So use a hierarchy of information, um, and he means put your main message front and center. Um, let the superfluous data and details just kind of recede to the background. Less is more. I'm sure you hear this all the time, but simplicity is good. Keep it clean, keep it simple. And um, reskin the wheel. And what 
what my canvas means here is that if you've got a chart or a graph and you're not happy with it, don't scrap it totally. Just design it better because there's probably a couple of easy fixes for you that you'd be surprised by. So when we're making these data visualizations, there are four main components that are worth keeping in mind. Um, a good visualization is going to use the data itself, the story that you're trying to show, your overall goal or message in mind. So this is, you know, what do you ultimately want your audience to take away from this graphic? Or what do you ultimately want your audience to do with this information? And you combine these three things with the visual form that they take, and that's going to create a successful visualization. The data visualization process isn't exactly a novel idea here. It's pretty straightforward. To create a data visualization, you're going to start with your research and combine that with your goal and the audience you're trying to reach. And you're going to cook up a concept. And your concept is, it's not just an idea, but it's something that you can actually explain to someone. It's going to be a little more tangible than just a regular idea. And once you have a solid concept, that's when you can sketch it out. And after a couple rounds of edits and revisions, then you can start to design it and make your data graphic pretty. Here are a quick few tools to keep in mind when you're creating your data visualizations. So for starters, make sure you consider your color. Colors mean things to different people. So for example, red and green can be considered loaded colors. Um, you know, you see red on the street and you know to stop, and you see green, you know you're good to go. So keep that in mind when you're making color choices. It's also worth considering to test for color blindness, because you want your data visualizations to be able to reach the greatest audience that you can. Um, so just try saving a file in black and white and seeing if you've got the right amount of contrast in your data graphic. Consider your size. You don't want people to have to squint to read your data graphic. Um, you want the proper information to be sized appropriately so that it's easy to see. Again, consider your fonts, and this is something we'll talk about in a slide or two. You're going to want informative labels because this is going to increase the information density on your graphics. And we'll get a little bit into this in a little bit as well. Um, but bottom line is you want every element that's on your graph or your data visualization to represent the data itself. And so with that, we go to the next one. Remove any unnecessary details or what we call chart junk. You don't need those extra tick marks or lines in the background. They're just distracting to your audience. Be consistent with your formatting choices. Don't change fonts. Don't change the size of elements. Just Again, we're just trying not to distract our audience. Keep in mind your final product while you're making them. So save the appropriate file type while you're doing this. We'll talk about this in a little bit too. And then my number one tip for everyone out there is get an objective opinion on your data visualization when, when you're making it. Um, sometimes we get really bogged down in our data and we work with it so much that it's really easy to overlook certain elements and getting someone who's a little less familiar with your data or who hasn't been staring at it for six months to look at your graphic, that'll be a good way to tell if you're being effective or not with your visualization. So we're back to fonts. There are two main types of fonts out there. We have serif fonts and sans serif fonts. Um, the difference being those little strokes on the ends of the letters, also known as serifs. So some examples of serif fonts are Times New Roman, Cambria, Palatino. In my opinion, serif fonts look a little old school. They, um, they're very reminiscent of like calligraphy and, uh, and typewriters. Whereas sans serif fonts just have a little more room to breathe. It's a little cleaner, more simple. So some examples of sans serif fonts are Arial and Helvetica, but there's a time and a place to use any font. So just make sure you consider them when you're designing your data graphic. 
we need to make sure we're using color modes correctly. So there are two main color modes that you can use for your data visualizations. We've got RGB, which is red, green, and blue, and CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Basically, if you're presenting your data graphic on the web or on a screen, um, if it's not gonna be printed, use RGB as your color mode because RGB is used for transmitted light, whereas CMYK is used for printed ink, which you would know if you've changed toner cartridges on a printer before. You've got four options that you need to change. So again, just remember your final product when you're saving your file types for uh, your science communication. You also need to consider whether you're gonna save your file as a vector file or a raster file. The difference between vector and raster, as you can see in those little boxes down under this fish, is that raster files are made up of pixels. So when you zoom in really far on a raster file, your image is gonna get pixelated. Whereas a vector file is made up of vectors, or essentially there's a function pre-programmed into your lines and shapes that tells the shape how to behave. So when you scale a vector file, you're not gonna lose quality. Um, a lot of your photographs are going to be raster files, but a lot of your symbols and diagrams are going to be vector files. And these two different file types have different modes you can save them in. So for vector, the most common file types are Adobe Illustrator or EPS, SVG, PDF. Um, these are all really good files you can save them in. Uh, one thing to note is that if you save it as an Adobe Illustrator file, that's the only program that you can work your, with your vector file in. Um, SVGs and EPS have a little more flexibility in what file or what programs you can open them in. Raster files, on the other hand, uh, those are JPEGs, TIFFs, GIFs, PNGs. Um, you're going to have fewer options on programs that you can open and edit your raster files with, but we're talking uh, Adobe Photoshop, essentially. So when you're making your data visualizations, it's important to know that form follows function. Your function is essentially your data that you're trying to present, and the form is the design elements that you're going to use to better convey your data. So if we run through a few quick examples, we're trying to find the ideal balance between function and form. So this example here is a generic export from Microsoft Excel. Um, as you can see, it's not very straightforward in what it presents. The title means nothing. The, uh, the colors don't appear to mean anything. There's redundancy. We have numbers built on top of our bars, but we also have axes with numbers on them. We also have hatch marks in the background that contribute nothing to the data itself. So if we were to redesign this with a better form in mind, this is something we could come up with here. We've changed all of our titles to be a lot more meaningful. So instead of needing keys, we, uh, we've listed out what the regions are so we know what we're talking about. We have an active title at the top. We say Gracilaria is nitrogen limited, and we've added a symbol for a little bit of flair. Um, the color scheme here, it was considered, it was chosen because the Gracilaria is red. So again, this is something that's a little more arbitrary, but if you can make it more meaningful, you might as well. Um, and we've cleaned up the hash marks in the background. We've made it look a lot cleaner. And we've removed the redundancy and the numbers that are on the bars and on the axis. So here's another really good example. In the cleaned up version, we've taken away numbers that don't need to be there. We've changed the color scheme to be more meaningful. We've added an active title. We've removed the... Uh, the excess lines in the background, overall just a little more effective. So before I show you the form on this pie chart, I just want to make a note and say pie charts should probably never be 3D and never be 
tilted because this makes it much more difficult to compare the relative size of each wedge. Um, the wedges closest to us are going to look larger because they're closer. So to begin with, when we redesign this one, we flatten it out and turn it upright. Um, we've changed our color scheme to give a little more meaning. You know, the, the water land use is blue while terrestrial is green and human is brown. Um, and with this representation, we've actually split up this pie into three different sections. So land use by area, and we've divided it into type of land use. We could go one step further, and we could organize the wedges of this pie by relative size. So here we see that shrubland has the most land use by area, where water and developed lands have the least. But if what we're really trying to do is compare the amount of land use by area, maybe a pie chart isn't the most effective way to do that. Maybe we just need to compare the relative size of a bar graph. So here we've removed the color to make it less distracting. We've taken away the axes because we've got the percentages right there on the bars themselves. And we've oriented it in a way that's really easy to compare the bars to each other. And inevitably, you're going to need to present a table in your data at some point. But just design it better. There are a couple of quick fixes. So center align your text so it's easier to read. Um, bold your axes, highlight the important information. It's pretty quick and easy to do. So when we're making our data visualizations, you're going to, you can find inspiration from anywhere. This is an example from a book that we published called Shifting Sands, which is about the Maryland coastal bays. So this timeline was created for the cover and it was inspired by that whelk shell that we had a really good photograph from. But so let your data inspire you. It can help give you better context for your visuals. And now I just want to show a few different examples of data visualizations. Um, so this one is the effect of nutrient loading on primary producers. And so basically, as you can see, uh, Nutrient loading increases as light availability decreases, but we see that the optimal seagrass habitat is right at the balance between the two. And everything in this visualization is going to contribute to the content. So the density and the size and the color of the seagrass in the center makes me understand that that is optimal seagrass habitat. Um, the scalloped edge along the top of the illustration helps us know that we're underwater without having to say specifically that we're underwater. So this is a pretty good, pretty clear example. Another good example um, is the evolution of Assateague Island. So we have three different snapshots here, one from 1850, one from 1942, and one from 2005. Um, we've presented them side by side to show an overall comparison of the three. And then in the one on 2005, we actually have all three years presented in the same figure, and that helps you get a better idea of the change that's happened over the 150 years or so. And uh, one thing that I love about this map is the fact that it was presented on an angle because it matches the data very well, but it's also just a little more dynamic and a little unique. So that's it for my examples. So to summarize, keep in mind the goal of your data visualizations. You want to communicate your information clearly and efficiently. Um, be content driven, but don't neglect the design of your data graphics. Of course, you need to find the balance between function and form and try to have fun and make your data more interesting. For next week, you don't have a lot of homework. All you need to do is bring in a data figure of your own for Friday. Um, basically, we're going to be making a before and an after figure. So don't jump the gun. We'll talk about tools for making a better after figure, but just bring in a figure to class for Friday. And uh, we've also got a few different resources posted on Moodle. So go ahead and check out the different videos and websites that we've got in the course materials folder for next week. And otherwise, you can email me if you have any questions.